In a recent video, Joel Telling, the 3D printing nerd, 3D printed two very large Legos, but when he tried to fit them together... So, I printed a Lego block, and it's a very large Lego block, but for some reason, the second one that I printed, they won't, or they won't, they won't fit together. So, today in this video, I want to answer the question of, come on, I gave you one job, how come you can't do it, Mr. 3D Printer? Hmm. So it can be frustrating with 3D printers when you are trying to make something to match with measured uh, dimensions in real life or even against its own dimensions. But when you try to put them together, they don't fit and you end up having to pull out the drill or sandpaper and adjust it a little bit until it will. Why can't 3D printers just make something accurately the way that we designed it? Well, it turns out there's a lot of roadblocks to making this happen. I'm not really sure in what order to tackle them, so it's not like any of these are more common than the other. They all kind of work together to making it very difficult to get accurate prints, but it is possible and there are some solutions to it. I think the first thing I want to talk about is curve approximation, and to do that, we're going to jump over to Blender so I can show you something. So here in Blender, I have a circle. It looks pretty good, right? In fact, this is a cylinder, a three-dimensional cylinder that is two millimeters wide, very small. Why would you want to make a cylinder this small? Well, uh, maybe you want to use this to make a hole in something that you're going to drive a 1.75 millimeter piece of filament through. And so two millimeters is, is a little bit of wiggle room, but otherwise good, and you would think that that would be fine. Now, this particular cylinder looks really, really good. It looks like a curve, but it's not a curve. If we go into edit mode, we will see that it's just a bunch of very small, flat faces right next to each other. This particular cylinder has 200 faces on it to make it look this round and this smooth. I have hidden in here another cylinder as well. Can you see that yellow line right there? Here, let me pull it into local view. This cylinder is also two millimeters wide, but it only has eight faces around the outside. And do you see a problem here? Here, let me pull up the other cylinder so we can see. Do you see this big hole or this big area right here where this eight-sided cylinder just doesn't fill in the space? The fewer sides that you have, the more it starts to cut into it. And in fact, you see this problem even at, at 16 or 32, which are very common sides, a uh, number of sides for a cylinder to have. So, of course, if a model has more sides, it'll be more accurate, but even then, it's cutting it off just a little bit. And this one right here, while it is a two millimeter hole at the widest point, at the smallest point, it's just barely gonna allow the filament through if it prints properly. Now, there's another problem with having holes like this in a 3D print. It's that as the 3D printer prints a hole going around, that filament kind of gets tugged a little bit as it goes, and it pulls these holes even smaller. So if you set up a two millimeter hole, but you have it low poly, it's probably only gonna end up being closer to 1.5, maybe only one millimeter, because of both of these things coming into play, the, the fact that the edges are being cut off and the fact that it's being pulled. If you're trying to make a hole, you sometimes have to make it very much bigger and it's not gonna match at all what you modeled when you made the modeling. So that's one problem, but that's not the only problem that you're going to run into. There's also the problem of your filament. If you're using 1.75 millimeter filament, but in reality, the filament that you're using is only 1.455, it's not going to, the, the amount of plastic that it pushes out is not going to produce a full width in your extrusion. Instead, it's going to be just a little bit thinner and it might just be thin enough to make it so that your press fit parts aren't going to press fit and they're going to be too loose. On the other hand, if it's putting out just a little bit too much filament because your filament is just a little bit wider, 
then your parts are not going to fit together at all, no matter how hard you jam them, and you're going to have to whittle them down with a blade or sand them down with sandpaper to get them to fit. And that's just frustrating. <laughs> Now, you might have a problem with your slicer. Some of the older slicers that we have ran into a ton of problems. Some of them, when you turned a corner, would kind of pause for a second before it went, and it would continue to kind of spit out plastic, so you'd end up with a blob everywhere you had a corner. Now, this is a problem in very old slicers, none of them that I think that we're using anymore. However, if you were designing a model for those old slicers in the early days of 3D printing that had a specific tolerance to it, a specific fit, you might have over adjusted and now in modern slicers, you have to scale it back up or, or do something to fix it because it was adjusted for those old broken slicers. <laughs> Another problem that you see common in some old slicers that aren't even that old that we still run into is that it will decide what the, the shape of the outside is and then draw on that shape. But it's drawing on that shape with a 0.4 millimeter extrusion or more, depending on your filament and your extrusion rate. And so it's 0.2 millimeters bigger than you expected on one side and 0.2 millimeters bigger than you expected on the other side. It's not to spec because it's drawing on the line. Now Cura 2 and Simplify 3D, and I'm pretty sure even the oddly named Slick 3-er, all adjust that and they even open up to you the possibility of adjusting that even further with some sort of horizontal XY compensation that you can just shrink things down so that they, so that extrusion width will be well inside or exactly inside of where you want it to be for your print. So that it might be that your slicer is the problem. Newer slicers allow you to adjust for it. But even the old version of Cura, the Cura 11 or Cura 15 or whatever it was before they just started calling it Cura 2, even that version of Cura doesn't have that possibility. So it might just be printing on the line and you might just be out of luck if you're using that Cura, which Octoprint does. And I like using Octoprint, so I'm stuck with a slicer that has that problem unless I want to go through and configure Slick 3 -er or something else on it. It might be that your printer's got a problem. I mean, if your printer is not properly calibrated, it might think that it's traveling a certain distance, but it's not putting enough steps into the motion, so it's not traveling far enough, or maybe it's putting too many steps or rotating more than it thinks per step, and so it travels too far. And so you might need to get your printer fixed. <laughs> Also, there's Z-Wobble. If you go around a corner real fast, your, your printer, uh, your, your head isn't going to change direction that fast. And as it's trying to change, it's going to go wobble, 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 and eventually it'll straighten out. That creates corner ringing, little ridges along those corners. And those corner ringings can throw off the dimensions. And so you might have to watch out for that. So... What's the solution? How do we fix this? Well, number one, fix your printer. Make sure it's as well calibrated as you can and make sure that you're aware of the way that it's printing. The second one, get good material. Now, I wish that 3D printers could have a little sensor on them, and some of them do, but most don't. A little sensor that measures the filament as it comes in, catches those little differences in not just filament to filament, but also in the individual roll. Some filament actually changes over the life of the entire roll. And even if you go to a manufacturer who says, oh, we're always on tolerance, well, what tolerance are they on to? Are they on to their tolerance last year or the year before that? Or did they correct themselves and now their tolerance is different and you've got some old filament that doesn't match with their new filament? This happens, this happens a lot. But like I say, I wish that we could make our printers so that they would detect those. But every time I, I try to advocate this and I've been advocating this for years, 
3D printer manufacturers say, ah, just get good filament here, we'll sell it to you. That's not a consumer friendly solution. Sorry, I'm going off on this one and, and because it's something that I really wish we could do, but it's just not happening in mass yet. <laughs> You can also fix things in your slicer. Like I say, if you've got the ability to do horizontal compensation, you can change that difference. But remember, your difference is doubled. If you reduce it by 0.2 millimeters, your entire model will be 0.4 millimeters smaller than you thought because it's 0.2 on this side and 0.2 on this side. So remember that. If you don't have any sort of horizontal or XY compensation in your slicer, you can adjust the flow rate. The flow rate is, a fudge factor really that's all the only way to describe it but it allows you to say okay just put out less plastic as you go and sometimes that will correct the problem you can fix the model and you can try and adjust your your uh the shapes in your model and make them slightly bigger or slightly smaller but i like this to be a last resort it feels dirty to me to fix a model so that it will produce an output that looks like what you want, when really we should just have the model be what it is and the printer should do the adjusting at some point there. So fixing the model, I don't advocate. And it means if you fix the model, that if they fix this problem later on down the line, your model is now obsolete. The last thing to do though is test. I have here a bag of, of 3D prints that I made of my robot chess set. Back when I was printing these to sell to people, I would have to, with every roll of filament and sometimes twice with each one of them, measure and test and try and adjust and, and keep on fiddling with it until I could get these two parts to snap together and hold and not let go. And even this is just a little bit too loose. This is why I don't sell these chess sets very often. It's frustrating to me that a roll of filament means that I have to go back into this testing phase, but that's what you have to do if you want to make regular and accurate 3D prints, which is why a lot of us who do 3D printing don't worry about accuracy most of the time. We reserve that for special occasions. Well. Joel, I hope that this has answered you and everybody else. I hope that this has helped you guys understand a bit more about 3D printing and how you can make accurate 3D prints. It is possible to do and it's very important that it's possible to do. And so I thank you guys for letting me talk to you about this and I hope that this helps. I want to thank you guys very much for watching. I want to thank my Patreon backers and I just want to remind you there's still room for more up there. So go ahead and check that out. As always, safety first. I'll see you next time. Do you want to know more about 3D printing but don't know where to start? Or did you buy a 3D printer but you need some help getting it going? Don't panic. The beginner's guide to the 3D printing galaxy is here, now, for you. Honestly, all we have to do is, is uh, slice to a 1.0 filament diameter and then divide the flow rate by the filament diameter that we're measuring as it comes in and boom and even if we have a small gap from where we're measuring it to where it's coming out of the nozzle it'll be closer than what we got